Okay, thank you. So dark matter particles uh, capture in uh, celestial bodies uh, can evaporate. And uh, in this talk, I'll try to s t tell you about this process and when this could be efficient. And I'll also show you what is the minimum uh, mass for dark matter particles in order for dark matter uh, capture to be actually efficient so that dark matter particles remain trapped within the objects and can have uh, phenomenological consequences. So actually, this is, um, this is based, most of the results that I, I'll show you are based on a, on a work I did with a former student of mine, uh, Raghavir Garani, who is now a postdoc at uh, Florence. And our idea originally was to actually systematically study what is the evaporation mass for any uh, object, a compact object, a spherical object in the universe, which is in a, a hydrostatical uh, equilibrium. So, um, so I'll show you what is the evaporation mass, uh, as I said, for, uh, for efficient dark matter capture. And uh, sorry, the evaporation mass for all these objects. And basically, I will be showing you results spanning from uh, a small planetary uh, satellites to giant stars. So we've, uh, we've heard during this uh, conference uh, many different ways in which captured dark matter could have uh, phenomenological implications, like for instance, uh, modifying the energy transfer, uh, like this was in the, in the 80s, was already proposed to solve the solar neutrino problem. Also, we heard how this uh, could heat up uh, uh, different objects by annihilation or scatterings. Uh, one can search uh, for uh, the neutrinos from the sun or from the earth. Uh, and uh, also, in some cases, uh, dark matter could even, captured dark matter could even collapse and form black holes. So we know, we've already heard in several talks what is the process of, of dark matter capture. We have dark matter floating around the celestial object. Eventually, these particles interact with the, with the nuclei of the object and get gravitationally bound and finally get trapped within. And uh, this, after, after uh, many scatterings, then they thermalize in, within the, the object. But if the dark matter particle's mass is very small, then the chances for these dark matter particles to scatter with, uh, with a nuclear the medium and get uh, to velocities uh, above the scale velocity are very high. And that is what dark matter evaporation is. And uh, in the rest of the talk, I will be telling you what is this minimum mass that dark matter ma particles mass have in order not to evaporate and, let's say, uh, not have any phenomenological consequence. Okay, so, but if you just want to get something from this talk, this is the number to remember. Um, this is uh, the way one can get a, a very reasonable estimate of the uh, dark matter evaporation mass for any object in the static equilibrium in the entire universe. Uh, this result is, this is the, the uh, uh, escape energy of dark matter particles in the center of the object uh, divided by the temperature of those dark matter particles. And uh, if you equate that to 30, you would get a number which is correct within a factor of 2 over a huge range of parameter uh, space. I'll, I'll show you that. Uh, actually, uh, this number is accurate for when you assume a cross-section, which is uh, the geometric cross-section, and uh, it is robust uh, within 30% for that cross-section. But as I said, even if you vary by many orders of magnitude cross-section, this number would give you a right estimate within a factor of two. Okay, so we know the evolution equation. We know that we have the capture rate. We know we have uh, the annihilation rate. If we have annihilations, uh, and then we have uh, the evaporation uh, uh, rate, which I will be focusing in this talk. And uh, there could be different uh, scenarios in which uh, dark matter equilibrates with uh, a capture equilibrates with uh, annihilation, uh, or capture can equilibrate with uh, evaporation. In that case, actually, what we see is that the number of particles that accumulate is exponentially suppressed. Actually, you, you can see that. In this, uh, in this plot, where you see the number of particles as a function of the mass. So if we are in the regime where evaporation is important, you see that the number of particles exponentially, uh, is exponentially suppressed. And actually, the, this uh, evaporation mass is basically a transition between these two regimes. And one can define the evaporation mass simply by the evaporation rate times this equilibration time being this product being of order one. And uh, the details, actually, the number you actually put here, one, two, three, one third, it doesn't really matter. As you will see, all the dependence, just because of this exponential uh, uh, behavior, all the dependence of the dark matter evaporation, or most of the dependence, are logarithmic. So it doesn't really matter what you put here. Okay, so we need to compute the capture, we need to compute the annihilation. Uh, 
we need to compute the evaporation. And yes, I will mention a couple of things which I think are important. One is the, what is the thermalized, the velocity distribution of thermalized dark matter particles, and this factor here, which is the uh, rate of scattering of, of dark matter particles to velocities above the escape, velo the escape uh, velocity so that they can actually escape. And in general, this, uh, this calculation is not analytical, but in some limits, uh, one can get analytical approximation, uh, for instance, for small cross sections, and when the mass of the dark matter particle is equal to the mass of the target nuclei, one can get a very simple uh, analytical estimate. I won't get into the details, but I just want to stress that you already have this uh, exponential factor with this E over T uh, factor that I was mentioning, exponent that I was mentioning before, and that actually is what drives uh, the definition of the dark matter uh, evaporation mass. But let me, let me show you what are the main two factors individually of this, the velocity distribution and the scattering rate. So uh, I'm showing you here uh, these two uh, terms uh, for two different values of E over T, 10 uh, is the blue and uh, uh, 30 is the green. But you see that that, that ratio is basically the ratio of, the, of the, uh, that dark matter mass. So a ratio of uh, dark matter mass is by a factor of three implies that the product of these two things is uh, many, many orders of magnitude difference. So a factor of three on the dark matter mass implies say, nine, ten orders of magnitude in the evaporation rate. So actually, the definition of the dark matter evaporation mass is set along the exponential tails of these two quantities. OK, so one can put numbers, do some uh, simple estimates, and one can compute this evaporation mass for, for instance, for the sun. And actually, one gets E over T of 29, which implies uh, an evaporation mass of 3.2 GeV. One can do the same for the, for the Earth. E over T is 34. And the evaporation mass that this implies is about 30, 13 GeV. But this is all. This this uh, this is well known. This has been computed in the 80s. And uh, but the, you see that already. We see that this E over T over, uh, around 30 is a reasonable estimate for this. Um, but we can uh, try to uh, see if there is a. Uh, as, this is as simple as as, as it seems uh, for any other object. So that is what we. What we wonder and we try to do is like, uh, let's try to compute uh, this evaporation mass for any object in the universe which is in a static equilibrium. So for that, we need modeling the objects. Uh, so what we did is uh, like, for instance, uh, we uh, uh, obtained the mass radius relation from observations. We obtained the, the mass core uh, temperature relation from modeling. Uh, sorry. Uh, mass escape versus escape uh, velocity relation. Uh, from uh, also models, although this uh, has very little impact because uh, the mass, the dark matter evaporation mass uh, has very mild dependence on this. Uh, and then we can, for instance, with all these ingredients, we can compute, for instance, the equilibration time for this uh, geometric cross-section. And in any object which is uh, below this dashed line, I'm assuming here the lifetime of these objects, like the, 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 the age of the, of the Earth, just to set a, uh, something by, uh, as a reference. So anything which is below this is in equilibrium. Uh, all these objects which are above uh, would not be in equilibrium, and actually, in, that, in those cases, the dark matter evaporation mass grows with time. So, but I will m be mostly discussing about this. Okay, so we can put all these things uh, uh, together and uh, compute the, the whole thing for, and this is the result for the dark matter evaporation mass, as I said, in 12 orders of magnitude from a small uh, planetary satellites to giant stars in the main, main sequence. And uh, one can do this. Uh, this is for the geometric cross section, and actually, you see this is the red, the red curve. And I show you for, uh, yes, to guide as a reference, the, the case, uh, in case uh, E over T is between 20 and 40. This is a gray band. I don't know if you can actually see it, but uh, the red curve is within that gray band. And that's what I said, that we, one can estimate the dark matter evaporation mass for this cross section within 30% accuracy uh, for any object in hydrostatic equilibrium in the universe. OK, but this is for a particular cross section. And uh, we can think of uh, having uh, what is the value for, of this dark matter mass, evaporation mass, for any other cross-section. Uh, so we did that exercise. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to mention that the minimum we get here is for uh, the, the least massive brown dwarfs, and we get a, an evaporation mass of, a, of around 0.7 GeV. So we can do this for, for, any, for many other values of the cross-section, actually. I show you here the same result for 10 orders of magnitude in cross-section. So actually, you, if you look at, in the vertical direction, the variation of the dark matter mass is within a factor of two. So that is what I, what I said, that the, the, this estimate of E over T of the order of 30 provides a very robust result within a factor of two of any object covering 12 orders of magnitude in mass, 10 orders of magnitude in cross-section. OK. so. Uh, we also competed, yes, just to mention, we also competed this for, 
as I said, it was all objects in a psychic equilibrium. So we also completed this for white dwarfs and neutron stars. And they are a lot more compact objects than the, the ones I, I, I saw in the previous case. And actually, you can get to evaporation masses much lower for white dwarfs. Cool white dwarfs, you can get down to MeV masses. And for neutron stars, actually, in the previous talk, you shouldn't worry about going down to the lower than 1 GeV. You can go down to KeV or so, which is the evaporation mass for cool neutron stars. But, uh, so, but, but this is well known. This, is, uh, this has been known for, for over 30 years. Uh, the, the, where is the evaporation mass of the sun, of the Earth, or other planets, even uh, other stars? Uh, so, so why caring about all this uh, at all? So the, the, the main idea Raul and I had was actually to, to do a systematic study, to see actually we could uh, grasp uh, something like E over T equal to 30, and that was uh, a, a stable result. And uh, what, was the, 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 what, what were the reasons uh, behind that uh, and uh, to understand uh, if we could get this uh, as a robust result? That is the, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, motivation of this. But uh, when we were doing this, actually, there were a, a few papers that appear claiming that there could be evaporation mass in different objects down to MEV range uh, with uh, equally strong phenomenological claims. And I, I'm trying to show you those results are not correct. And let me show you some examples. So there was this nice, nice idea uh, where they uh, claimed uh, that they, they could one could search for dark matter by looking at the heating of uh, exoplanets or brown dwarfs. And this is, uh, they saw different uh, uh, results for spin-dependent and spin-dependent. And you see that the, the mass reach for brown dwarfs goes down to MeV range. For Jupiters, it goes down to 30 MeV or so. And as I said, uh, for Jupiters, one should move the, the lines uh, towards the GeV range. And for brown dwarfs, it should be around a few hundred uh, MeV range. Uh, so uh, it is an overestimate of the mass reached by, by more than an order of magnitude. So how comes, uh, how, so basically the conclusion is that there is no room left uh, for Jupiters and very little room for brown dwarfs with this type of searches. So how comes uh, the, this underestimator on the, of, of the uh, evaporation mass in this paper? Oh, sorry. So, uh, the, so basically what, uh, what the, these authors did, it was applying this kind of condition, which is not exactly that, but it's more or less a condition on the most probable velocity, which is basically E over T equal to 1. And as I, as I try, try, try to show you, actually the evaporation mass is set along the exponential tail. So that is why uh, there is an underestimation of the evaporation mass. So they, there were a couple of other papers, for instance, searching for secluded dark matter uh, with gamma rays, like dark matter annihilates into a mediator. The mediator goes out of the celestial body and then decays into standard model pro particles and, and produces uh, gamma rays. Also, for instance, uh, doing it that with brown dwarfs. Again, this overestimates the mass reached by a factor of 200 in this case. Actually, this, was, uh, this had already been computed uh, about 12 years ago with the current dark uh, evaporation mass. Uh, also, one should take into account that this, uh, the, the limits from the sun, this is the limits from the sun, cover a bit lower in mass. Uh, the same kind of thing for searching for gamma rays from Jupiter. Again, this overestimates the mass reach for about a factor of 30. So there is a lot less uh, room left when actually one takes into account also the limits from, from the sun properly. Um, so is there a way out? Can we get actually a, a different uh, 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 evaporation mass by varying parameters in uh, crazy ways? So. Well, for instance, uh, what about the location and annihilation cross-section? As, as I told you, uh, the, the evaporation mass depends logarithmically on most of the parameters and, uh, involved in the problem. So a factor of two in the dark matter evaporation mass requires many orders of magnitude in cross-sections, so density of the dark, dark matter or uh, uh, velocities. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, very complicated. So what about the spin-dependent and spin-dependent interaction? Actually, this has a very, very mild effect and only has uh, importance for rocky planets. So not really important. What about adding self-scatterings? Uh, self Actually, when we are in the, in the thin regime and the weak interaction cross-section regime, adding self-scatterings uh, only goes in the wrong direction. If we are in the, in the thick regime, actually adding self-scatterings would help because it suppresses uh, evaporation, but the, the, the self-scattering cross-section that we would need for this to be effective are already excluded by observation like bullet cluster ones. Uh, what about uh, uncertainties in the density profiles that we, we consider actually uh, we uh, varied all these uh, in, in different ways uh, within reasonable uh, variations, and this is really mild effect, less than 10%. What about the composition? We had to do some simplifications. Uh, the composition, we, if you take a crazy uh, composition of the objects, the, the variations are really uh, very, very mild, below 10% or so. What about temperature of the core? Um, this, this is the other static equilibrium, so basically this is a virial theorem. So there is very little room for this. Uh, uh, 
Uh, there are some uncertainties, but they, again, they are very mild. So let me, let me conclude. Uh, so I tried to show you that uh, for all spherical celestial bodies in hydrostatic equilibrium, and I'll show you, I'll show you the results for the gal local galactic location and for the uh, geometric cross section. Uh, the result of the, of the mass, the, the evaporation mass for dark matter can, give, can be obtained within 30% for this cross section with just E over T equal to 30. So for uh, the minimum mass that we obtain for this, uh, for this uh, cross section is about 0.7 GV for the least massive brown dwarfs. Going down to evaporation masses uh, around uh, 100 MeV is really, really complicated. And uh, so this is why I think uh, all these conclusions in these papers need to be revised. Thank you. Questions? Zo. Uh, th thanks for a great talk. I, I just wanted to ask about uh, maybe uh, two more possibilities for slide 20, the, the ways out. Um, one, I think, is completely in the spirit of what you're, what you're doing, but it's in a very optically thick regime where you'd have light dark matter, not that much lighter, but more like an order of magnitude lighter. Um, and if it hits the Earth, and if its drift time is such that it's never really going to reach a layer uh, lower than the crust, then the evaporation temperature that you should be using is just the, the crust temperature. So it actually, it doesn't really contradict anything you're saying, it's just you get a slightly different uh, evaporation temperature and the crust of the earth is uh, less uh, hot. I don't, does that seem plausible? <laughs> well, in terms of like, for this, a much higher cross-section. Yeah, yeah, very, very optically thick regime, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the other one is newer and I don't know uh, whether you've had a chance to look at it and it's not, this is not my thing, but uh, there's a paper out by uh, the same uh, authors where they uh, pointed out that in uh, theories of dark matter where you couple to baryons uh, with a negative sign, you can have a potential barrier. Mm -hmm. So after you're captured, um, there's sort of a, a reflective barrier provided so long as you have a, a density gradient in, in sort of the object. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very special model, but I'm just wondering if you, you have thoughts on that. You mean these uh, uh, this, uh, uh, long-range interactions? Yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't want to get into that. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Um, let, me, let me give a short answer that we can discuss offline. Uh, good. Uh, this is, uh, at the very best, fine, very, very, very fine-tuned. OK. Thanks. Okay. Um, any other question? All right, so let's thank our speaker again.